So you may be wondering, why Buddhism? Why choose Buddhism of all the different things that we might consider in our lives? I had a, a recent uh, question by a, a viewer, one of you, who asked, why should a person come to Buddhism? And this is a, a simple question, but one that is definitely worth answering. And by the way, if you have any questions that you would like me to answer, you don't think I've done a video on in the past, please link, leave them down below in the comments boxes. Uh, I always love to, to hear your questions. And if I've answered them before, I'll try to find a video for you. Otherwise, I will, I'll make one if I, if I can, if, I, if, if, this, if it's a question that I can answer. So why come to Buddhism? Well, there's not going to be any single answer to this question because each of us, of course, is going to come to Buddhism from our own angle, with our own background and baggage and interests. Further, there isn't really a single thing Buddhism. Instead, there are many Buddhisms. There are many ways of practicing Buddhism. There are many ways of approaching it. There are many descriptions of the Dharma. I've done a past video on the three major schools of Buddhism, which I will leave a link to down below in the notes if you haven't seen it. That will go into some detail about different uh, approaches within Buddhism, but in any event, uh, there's a lot of different ones. Further, not everyone is going to be comfortable with Buddhism. Buddhism is not right for everybody. Uh, nothing really is. Now, uh, to, to turn to our question, why Buddhism? I think a couple of different reasons why Buddhism. First of all, I think it makes a lot of sense, and secondly, it promotes a better life in many ways, and I, I want to get to both of those in this video. And then I'll touch on some key questions at the end. So our first topic, Buddhism makes a lot of sense. Now I can hear some of you uh, questioning about rebirth, issues of rebirth, which are a part of traditional Buddhism. I'll, I'll touch on that at the end of this video. But to begin with, Let's talk about what I think is the heart of the Buddhist Dharma, the, the three marks of existence, or one of the hearts of the Buddhist Dharma, the Buddhist description of the world, or the three marks of existence. The first of these marks is that all things change. Everything is change. There's no lasting permanency in the world. And I think this is an undeniable fact, at least in our daily lives, that things change. Of course, they change at different rates and different speeds, but there's nothing that we can count on literally to remain the same forever. Now, physicists among us may quibble about certain kinds of elementary particles. Uh, that may be so. It's not clear to me one way or the other. But that doesn't really touch on our lived experience. Our lived experience, our, the experience that we have in daily life, which is really what Buddhism talks about, is one of, 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 of constant change. And one of the upshots of that is that the things that we ordinarily pursue, like wealth and fame, praise, uh, pleasure, all of these things are things that we cannot be certain to hold in the longer term. These are things that come and go. We may be praised today, but we'll be condemned tomorrow. We may be, uh, have some pleasure today, but we're not going to have that pleasure tomorrow necessarily. We may be wealthy today, but who knows what the future will bring? All of these are passing in one way or another. They come and they go. The second point is that life is difficult, that life is unsatisfactory in some kind of a, a deep global sense. That is to say that life involves suffering. So, for example, none of us can escape old age, illness, and death. These are simply facts of life, and in that way, the Buddhist picture of reality is not a Pollyanna-ish kind of picture. It describes the way that although we have many desires and wants and cravings and needs, not all of them can be satisfied and not all of them or none of them can be satisfied literally forever. We're going to experience loss. We're going to experience old age, illness, and death. Indeed, if we're lucky, we'll experience old age but will certainly experience illness and death. But for all that, the Buddhist picture is anything but pessimistic, and we'll get to that point in a minute. The third point, and the perhaps the most surprising to some of us, is that there's no permanent fact about the self, that the self also is in constant change. In other words, 
that first point we made about constant change, about change being true of everything, also encompasses our self, that there's no permanent essence to who we are. This may be a surprise to some of us. Some of us may not find this particularly easy to believe, but it's been verified, I think, again and again by cognitive sciences, the neurosciences, that the self is essentially a kind of a construct. It's something that we build up. It's not something that's inherent. It may be indeed useful to us in many circumstances to have this concept of self, but it's not a permanent and unchanging sort of locus of who we really are. And it took great, I think, great wisdom to see this truth 2,500 years ago. Knowing and seeing this truth, that there isn't a permanent and essential locus to who we really are, we can relax around notions of our own identity. We can relax around the kind of egoism that tends to arise from such notions of identity. And this makes our life easier and the lives of those around us easier. So these basic tenets of Buddhism make a lot of sense. They're deeply and wisely true. However, I think in a more important way, Buddhism promotes a healthy life. Buddhism promotes a good, healthy way of living. That is to say, it's not simply a bunch of beliefs. It's not simply a bunch of things that we should accept or not, but rather a practice. So, as I said, Buddhism claims that life is difficult, that life can be painful. But there are practices that we can use to overcome these notions of pain. There are things that we can do to separate the suffering in life from the pain of life. That is to say, pain in life is something that we cannot avoid. There are aspects of life that are going to be painful. We're going to have physical pain. At times, perhaps, we may have forms of mental pain. But then there's the suffering on top of it, the obsession, the lamentation that goes on that is not essential, that we can learn to let go of, that we can learn through practice to dissolve. And those, that is the distinction that we need to make when we're in Buddhist practice, a distinction between pain on the one hand and suffering on the other. The Buddha had a very famous parable of the two arrows, where he talked about how all of us are going to be stuck by one arrow, the arrow of pain, but that over time we can learn not to be stuck with that second arrow, which is the arrow of suffering. I have a video about that topic, about that parable, and I'll leave a link to that video down below in the notes if you want to see it. So that said, what sorts of practices does Buddhism offer? Well, perhaps most famously, Buddhism offers various practices of meditation, many such practices. Practices involving calming, involving focus and stress relief. Practices that, practices that support beneficial emotional states, such as kindness and compassion. Buddhism also recommends a practice of ethical living, so that we can reduce the harm to ourselves and to others. Now, all of this may sound to you like second nature, like you don't even need a philosophy for this, it's just obvious. And that's the very point that I wanted to make in the first part of this video. Why Buddhism? Because it's very clear. It's very obvious in a certain sense. There's nothing particularly controversial about a lot of what Buddhism is on offer, what Buddhism suggests for us. At its heart, Buddhism does not require us to to take on board any kind of very questionable practices. That's the very point. Now, it is true that there are certain aspects of traditional Buddhist Dharma that may be questionable to some of us. For example, the claim that there is rebirth, that we've had lives in the past and we'll have lives in the future. If that seems second nature to you, if that seems obvious to you right now, then, then great, you'll be very happy with a traditional Buddhist uh, a picture of the world. On the other hand, if you find that somewhat difficult to believe or difficult to accept, simply be aware that there also are secular interpretations of Buddhism, secular interpretations of the Dharma, that 
focus more on a this-life practice and that leave those kinds of more speculative claims up in the air or perhaps not within the realm of, of ordinary practice at all. It depends upon the practitioner. I myself uh, prefer a secular interpretation of the Dharma. It's simply one that works for me. To me, Buddhism is best seen as a practice for this life, one aimed at wisdom, at psychological insight, and at betterment. Indeed, when the Buddha and his uh, right-hand disciple, who is considered the greatest in wisdom, Sariputta, when they were asked, uh, what is the essence of Buddhism and the Buddhist practice, what they said was this, the purpose of living the spiritual life under the Buddha is extinguishment, that is particular extinguishment of suffering and of states of greed and hatred and delusion by not clinging. So it is a path of this extinguishment of, of suffering, the suffering in our lives, by seeing the importance of releasing our clinging to things in the world, releasing our hatreds, releasing our greed. That is the heart of Buddhist practice. That is the heart of the Buddhist Dharma. Research in psychology also shows that it can be beneficial to our happiness, to our quality of life, to feel as though we are on a path of practice, in particular on a path of practice with others. And that sense of sangha, of togetherness with others on a path, is something also that the Buddhist practice, the Buddhist practice offers us. It can give our lives meaning. Now, it's not going to be, as I say, it's not going to be right for everyone. However, it offers a lot of benefits. One of these, among others, is this clarity of mind that comes from, from regular practice of meditation. And if you're interested in looking at beginning that kind of Buddhist practice, I have an earlier video on that very topic, which I'll leave a link to, to up here on the screen if you haven't seen it or would like to see it again. Thanks so much. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, consider taking a look at my Patreon page, which is linked down below and up here on the screen, and see if you want to help out and support the channel. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next one. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.